Quality's question. May I say how proud I was to host an event last night marking the host magazine's publication of the list of 100 women in Westminster. It was an honour to celebrate so many inspiring colleagues. I wish them and everyone a happy International Women's Day. Right, let us start with questions to the Minister for Women and Equality. We start with Minera Wilson. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, gender pay gap reporting continues to motivate employers to look at their pay data and improve workplace gender equality, and huge progress is being made. The gender pay gap has fallen by approximately a quarter in the last decade, but of course there is more work to be done. Can I thank the Minister for her response? An 18-year-old entering the workforce today will not see gender pay equality in her lifetime. With the national gender pay gap at 14 per cent and growing, Will the Minister commit this International Women's Day to ending the motherhood penalty by fixing our broken childcare system and ensuring every family can access affordable childcare? Uh, well, absolutely. And can I say it's this Conservative government that in 2017 introduced the world leading regulations, which yeah. has enabled us to be able to record uh, the gender pay gap uh, and, and the progress that we're making. But we're also committed to the childcare aspect, which is uh, difficult for many women. That's why we've announced additional funding of £160 million this year, £180 million next year, and £170 million the year after for local authorities to increase the hourly rates uh, to pay for childcare, which is so important to women. We now come to Minister Annalise Stoltz. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year, the gender pay gap was 12 per cent higher than it was in 2020, the year the Minister for Women and Equalities was first appointed to the Government Equalities Office. If not the Minister for Women and Equalities, then can anyone on the government front bench please apologise to women for that increase this International Women's Day? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for uh, uh, I thank the Shadow uh, Secretary of State for that question. I mean, it's disappointing she can't welcome the progress that has been made. In fact, um, it's not just in terms of the gender pay gap. We're uh, supporting pay transparency, which is equally important in making sure women are paid the same as men. The STEM Returners pilot that we're launching for 75,000 people to return to the STEM sector, mainly women. Uh, carers' leave, flexible working, shared parental leave, uh, supporting the member for Bath with her private member's bill of harassment in the workplace. There's huge progress in supporting women in work. At least odds. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No apology then for that increase in the gender pay gap over recent years and no real action, it seems. Now, other ONS figures show that the gender pay gap for women in their 50s and 60s is nearly four times higher than for those in their 30s. 185,000 women aged between 50 and 64, have also left the workforce since 2020 at a cost of £7 billion to our economy. So will the Minister back Labour's proposal for larger companies to publish menopause action plans to support women to stay in work, boost productivity and grow our economy? Or will this action to support working women just again be dismissed as left-wing? Well, I'm pleased that the Labour Party are getting uh, to the, with the programme that they can actually define what a woman actually is for a start. Uh, so we won't take any lectures from them. But perhaps the Labour Party also need to get their own house in order before lecturing the rest of the country. Because according to the Telegraph in January, the Labour Party paid their black workers 9% less than their white workers uh, and absolutely need to get their own house in order. Shannon, SNP spokesperson, Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I highlighted to the Leader of the House last week, the gender pay gap between women and men currently sits at nearly 15 per cent. And we know that women are not a homogenous group, so that gap will vary further based on intersecting characteristics, including ethnicity and disability status. So I wonder if the Minister, in line with the theme for this year's International Women's Day, will embrace equity by mandating gender pay gap reporting and action plans for all employers, as well as introducing ethnicity and disability pay gap reporting requirements. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as I set out, it's this government in 2017 which set out the world leading regulations requiring larger employers to publish uh, their average uh, salaries. 
But that doesn't stop other employers from doing the same. If we, uh, we do, would have to pass new regulations to reduce that and change the Equality Act. But actually, we are seeing all employers wanting to uh, reduce the uh, gender uh, pay gap. And we are leading the way in government with uh, the Department for Culture, Media, Sports and DWP having uh, eliminated that gap in their own department. To Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm going to have to be quicker. I'll never get in that hundred, Westminster. Um, <laughs> the Law Commission recommended against adding sex and gender to the hate crime laws. It found that the addition of these characteristics might make the prosecution of crimes which disproportionately affect women and girls actually more difficult. The Government shares the Law Commission's concern. Parliament has repeatedly voted against making misogyny a hate crime last year, and there are no plans to change. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I um, recognise the arguments that have been made. Most violence against women originally in misogyny. Therefore, making misogyny a hate crime would send such a powerful signal to all offenders that all their offences would be taken with the utmost seriousness and investigated properly. Victims of vain cousins have, have argued that if only their reports against this indecent exposure would have been taken seriously, Sarah Everard might still be alive today. Mr Speaker, isn't it time that we make misogyny a hate crime? I beg to disagree. It may send a signal, but it's more of a virtual signal than a real signal. We have more police officers than ever, and we are determined to stamp out violence against women and girls. So James Durdridge. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Health disparities exist across a wide variety of conditions, from cancer to mental health, and contribute to the unacceptable variation in health outcomes. Therefore, the major conditions strategy which we are launching will apply a geographical lens to end the disparities in health outcomes across England. Sir James, that reply. But what does she make of the interesting comments by Sir Chris Whitty around health inequalities in coastal areas like South End, and what are the governments uh, proposing to do about those inequalities? Well, I thank uh, my right honourable friend for that question. He's absolutely right. There are disparities. Uh, there's an eight-year uh, uh, life uh, difference between a woman born in Blackpool and a woman born in Wokingham, and we want to end that. That's why our major condition strategy is in parallel to the work NHS England's doing on their core 20 plus five, where we're targeting the most deprived 20 per cent of populations in the country with the five key health conditions that are making those disparities apparent today. Speaker, uh, uh, the average life expectancy of a woman with a learning disability is around 18 years shorter than women in the general population. So, on this International Women's Day, what can the Minister say to women with learning disabilities about the disparity in their life expectancy in Britain? Well, the Honourable Gentleman makes a very good point, and that's exactly why mental health is part of the ma major condition strategy. Because people with mental health and learning disabilities do uh, suffer from poorer physical health. Uh, and that's why it's absolutely crucial that we don't see. Uh, if you heard, if you listened to me, he would heard I said learning disabilities. Uh, that is why it's crucial that we don't see people with a learning disability in isolation. That we look after their physical health as well as uh, their conditions that they suffer with. The Minister Yasmin Qureshi. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pregnant women who live in the poorest areas of England are twice as likely to die than those living in the most affluent areas. Shockingly, black women are four times more likely to die during childbirth. This government has had 13 years but has failed to tackle maternal health inequalities. What action is the minister taking to address these appalling disparities? Yeah. Well, absolutely. That's why we set up the Maternity Disparities Task Force. We're working with the Chief Midwife to drive down those disparities, and it's why we're working with NHS England and why maternity is one of those core cool, uh, 20 plus five elements. Because we recognise there's huge disparities across the country, which we want to eliminate. Hello, Morgan. Four, please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Department are taking, uh, talking to a range of stakeholders to assess evidence and options for a more targeted approach to consumer protection from April 2024. Hello. Hello, Morgan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, over 200,000 disabled households have lost out on the £150 warm home discount scheme due to a change in who the government deems entitled to claim, including people in my constituency. Disabled people often require additional energy to run specialist equipment and to keep their homes warmer. So, 
Given that there's no appeals process, will the Minister agree to uh, re uh, review this problem in the system and work with colleagues to address it next year? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, this Government has been committed to supporting disabled people and a whole range of people around the cost of living crisis, but of course, as I have mentioned, we will be meeting and uh, discussing this. Ben Bradshaw. Question five, sir. The Government takes all forms of hate crime seriously. We accept, expect the police to fully investigate all of these sorts of hateful attacks and make sure the cowards who commit them feel the full force of the law. The Government is committed to reducing all crime, including hate crime, which is why we are recruiting 20,000 additional police officers. Ben Bradshaw. She will know, uh, Mr Speaker, that trans people are already the group most likely to be the victims of violent crime, and there was a massive 56 per cent increase in hate crime against trans people in the last year against what I conceive to be a background of semi-official transphobia in England, like the moral panic that led to Section 28 in the 1980s. So what is her view of the comments of her party's deputy chairman, who called on the Conservative Party to campaign, and I quote, on a mix of culture wars and trans debates? With the greatest respect, I don't accept the way the narrative has been put with the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. We have to look at all of these issues, but what I want to say is I welcome the increase in reporting of just the sort of offences that the Honourable Member says, because it's only when people come forward that we can do something about it. And I think the increase in numbers to 56 per cent from 43 per cent previously is a good thing, because it means people are having more confidence in the police. There is more to do, but I certainly don't accept that this Government is as uh, against assisting this area as is said. We are putting huge amounts of education and effort into this, and we will, we will reap the benefits over it in the years to come. Andrew uh, Law. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question six. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government has taken steps to modernise the application process for obtaining a gender recognition certificate and to make an application more affordable. Applicants for a GRC are now required to pay £5, and the newly developed digital application process for GRCs launched on 29 June last year. Uh, does the Minister agree it is important to have a consistent approach for the, recognise, the recognition of overseas countries' GRC schemes? and that because of the complex interaction with the Equalities Act, <laughs> it is right to recognise only those countries that have equivalent approaches. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, a consistent approach to GRCs is fundamental to the effective functioning of legislation in this area. The GB-wide Equality Act was carefully drafted in light of and reflecting the specific limits of the UK-wide Gender Recognition Act. It is important for the effective functioning of the Equality Act that recognition of international GRCs is in line with the basic principles of the GRA. Jim Shannon. You, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the, the Minister for his response. Uh, uh, there are many people in, in Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom as a whole who have concerns over gender recognition certificates. Has the Minister had any opportunity to talk to some of those organisations to get their opinion so when we draw up a policy that is one that is recognised by everyone? So, Mr Speaker, I recognise that this is an area um, of, of considerable concern for some, but I think it is important that the debate is one that is calm and measured and absolutely respects the individuals involved. I have many meetings uh, with people from around the country on these specific issues, and we take careful consideration of all the points that are made, making sure that everybody feels confident that the law is in the right place. Edward Timson. Speaker, question seven. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Department for Business and Trade is keen to support entrepreneurs <coughs> from all communities, evidenced by a disproportionately high proportion of start-up loans accessed by ethnic minority-led businesses. The government's supported action was aimed at improving opportunities for ethnic minority entrepreneurs, set out in the Inclusive Britain report, and will be rep reporting back to Parliament shortly. Edward Jensen. Decision making, leadership, commitment, confidence, resilience, teamwork, and self esteem are all skills and attributes essential to entrepreneurialism, and that is also the case 
uh, that these can be fostered by high quality physical education in schools, which is why today's announcement of £600 million over two years to support primary school PE and sport is so welcome. But it's also the case, Mr. Speaker, that Sport England reported in December that children and young people uh, of black, Asian and other ethnicities are least likely to be active. So will my honourable friend use his good offices to upgrade from government aspiration to government policy the Association for Physical Education's recommendation to make PE a core subject in schools to help tackle this unacceptable disparity? Yeah. Yeah. Here, here, Mr Speaker. Uh, as someone who benefited from playing football, rugby and cricket at my state school, I am delighted at, at today's announcement as he refers to. My rational friend, the Secretary of State for Education, has today announced a package of activity to boost equal opportunities in school, sport, both inside and outside the classroom. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, may I take question 8 and 14 together? Tackling violence against women and girls is a government priority and something I regularly discuss with my colleagues. We have added violence against women and girls to the strategic policing requirement, meaning it is set out as a national threat for police forces to respond to, alongside issues such as terrorism. We have launched a £36 million fund for interventions for domestic abuse perpetrators to improve the safety and feeling of safety of victims, their children, and to, risk the, and to reduce the risk posed by perpetrators. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is a sad fact that walking home at night is for too many women and girls a time when they feel exposed to danger. And, Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. But sadly, for some, when they get home, home is not a place of refuge, it is a place of danger. During the periods of the national lockdown in the pandemic, this became a reality for more women and girls, with the police and domestic abuse support services reporting an increase in cases of victims experiencing abuse in their own homes. So will my right honourable friend advise me what, what progress has been made in supporting the frontline services? <coughs> I'm pleased to be able to say that Northampton PCC has received 3.7 million across the Safer Streets Fund today. The 750,000 through the current round four of a range of interventions on uh, transport and therapy. And what I also would like to say is that we have training for NHS to make sure we have an all systems process to improving this. Better training for those that work in healthcare, in education, a whole system approach. This government is committed to assisting. Sir Edwardley. Um, as the uh, father of three young women, like any parent, I worry about their safety. Society seems to become harder, and old fashioned values of respect towards women seem to be vanishing in many parts of our society, even in the police. So, what practical efforts can the government make to make young women feel safe in the streets, particularly in areas of our great cities? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that the Prime Minister has daughters and shares your concerns. What I can say is that Lincolnshire Police and Crime Commissioner has received 1.3 million across the Safer Streets round so far. That's almost 400,000 in the current round four for extra CCTV and police training to respond to Vaughan. This is part of a wider picture, and we are advancing. I'm very proud of what the government's doing. Rosie Duffield. Mr Speaker, an Afghan woman is smuggled into the UK on a small boat because she can't access the resettlement scheme. Once here, she is trafficked into prostitution and abused by a grooming gang. Under the government's new bill, she'd be unable to access modern slavery support and she'd be returned to an unsafe country. Does the minister agree we must make sure that all vulnerable women are safe from these kind of crimes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of work going on with engaging with stakeholder groups to see what we can do to make sure that everyone is safe. I have spoken to several groups about this issue and it is being considered. Let nobody be mistaken, this Government is extremely strong in making sure that vulnerable women, wherever they come from, are safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, catcalling and other gender-based microaggressions are still commonplace in schools. Chester Sexual Abuse Support Service, who works closely with schools across my constituency, tell me there's still a lack of awareness, education and prevention regarding these issues. Will the Minister tell me what's been done to resource schools to raise awareness and help young people challenge behaviours which lead to abuse? 
There is a wide range of work that is going on within schools with their training to make sure that young people understand more clearly what is and what is not accessible and acceptable. In relation to more national uh, interventions, we have issues such as the Ask for Annie um, scheme in pharmacies, and also we have the Enough social media campaign, and that has really cut through. The responses we have had have been unprecedented to that campaign. So this government is committed and making good progress to assist young people to understanding what is and what is not acceptable. We now come to topicals. Chris Stevens. But one, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Can I wish everyone a happy International Women's Day, yeah. where we celebrate 51% of the population? I am proud of this government's record in supporting women, whether it's young girls uh, playing more sport in school or the first ever women's health strategy, which this year will roll out the prepayment certificate for HRT, pregnancy loss certificates this summer, and the levelling up of IVF access. I am proud, Mr. Speaker, to announce today £25 million to roll out women's health hubs across England the one-stop shop for all women's health needs, which will drastically improve women's experience of health care in England. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of a legal agreement <coughs> under the Equalities Act between McDonald's and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. People cannot walk in front of a member when he's asking his question, <coughs> Chris Stevens. So, Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of a legal agreement under the Equalities Act between McDonald's and the Equalities and Human Rights Commission over the handling of complaints of sexual harassment. Does the Minister believe that is solely an issue of a toxic culture at McDonald's, or will she look at whether women working on zero-hour contracts across the economy are at increased risk of experiencing sexual harassment because of depending on male managers for future shifts? Yeah. Well, we take sexual harassment in the workplace very to be shouted down uh, by the entrance of a man. Um, we take sex- Minister! Minister! Nobody will shout you down. It happens every time. When the Prime Minister comes, they will happen again. Don't worry. Come on. Uh, I'll try again, then, Mr Speaker. Uh, once again, the Government is very uh, keen to tackle sec- sexual harassment in the workplace. That's why we're supporting the Honourable Member's bar, uh, her private member's bill, because it is such a serious issue. Simon Jupp. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm proudly backing a campaign to improve uh, services for menopause sufferers in uh, the county of Devon. In society and at work, stigma remains a barrier for many people to get the support they require. Can my honourable friend outline what steps the government is taking to prevent menopause discrimination in the workplace? Mr Speaker, we are working with employers and employees on this crucial matter to make sure there is no stigma in the workplace for those experienced the impact of menopause. And to this end, I was delighted to announce on Monday the appointment of Helen Tomlinson as the DWP Menopause Employment Champion. She will have a key role driving awareness, promoting the benefits to both business and the economy of a fully inclusive workplace. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Disabled people are more than twice as likely to experience domestic abuse and sexual violence as non-disabled people. The National Disabled Strategy sets out a roadmap to improve the protection and support available to disabled people in their homes, but was last year found to be unlawful by the High Court for not having given the dis- disabled community an adequate opportunity to shape the strategy. Can the Minister confirm that tackling the scourge of violence against disabled people will be a central pro- priority of the new Disability Action Plan? And will she guarantee that the new Action Plan will be shaped by dis- <laughs> Violence against disabled people in the home or anywhere is just as important as violence against anybody else, and we are giving unprecedented monies towards stopping this sort of violence. It is all about education. The Police Chiefs Council and the College of Policing are working hard on this, and we are making progress. Sir James Dudridge. Mr Speaker, uh, young men often struggle with their mental health, particularly suicidal thoughts, which can hit like a heart attack. What more can the government do? Indeed, what more can each individual member of this House do to help those young men? Absolutely, and that's why we're setting out the prevention of suicide strategies where we're looking at high risk groups uh, like men. Uh, but can I also point out uh, the work that Home Office is doing in setting up helplines for men? There's £200,000 uh, going into those helplines, and so far they've supported 10,000 men who've needed support. 
Morgan. Stephen Morgan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New businesses are almost three times as likely to be started by men as by women. Does the Minister agree with Labour's plan to work with the British Business Bank to support female founders achieve their ambitions? Yes. Yes. are once again late to the party because the Conservative government are already delivering on this. We set up the High Growth Task Force, getting more women into setting up their businesses, but high growth businesses, and to end the, the disparity in venture capital, where for every pound that's given, 89 pence currently goes to men's businesses and only a penny to women.